Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories to people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story. Dr. Mikos was escorted out by security and fired because I found something on his laptop. The second story. Boss told me I should only do what he tells me to do and nothing else. The third story. We bent the rules for a customer to make him happy. He didn't feel like we bent the rules far enough for him, so he canceled his order. And the first story is... No, I am the master of baiting. It's a tale of revenge, a petty grudge in giving the doctor exactly what he requested from Mr. Tato's IT department, who is me. Okay, so a while ago the resident doctor at Mr. Tato's Tato plant resigned to go for greener pastures, which is a shame because he was the nicest guy. A couple of weeks later, Mr. Tato's medical wing sent us a replacement doctor, and I almost instantly didn't like the guy, who we will call Dr. Mikos. I like to think I have a pretty sharp intuition, but I don't really let it drive my behavior in front of people I just met. But holy sh did he ever work to deserve it. During the course of his first couple of months at the plant, Dr. Mikos lost the documentation for my contractors several times, then denied them entry because they had no documentation. This caused several vital repairs to our network infrastructure to go behind schedule, and Francis the plant director to get on my A about it. Was specially demanding of my time, most of the time for petty things I can't control or address. Didn't even get a ticket or anything, he would just call me over to look at his computer demanding I fix it. Not his work computer, his personal computer. Also somehow made enemies of most of the department. This will come into play later. Then the incident. Due to electrical equipment failure for quite some time all the networking infrastructure had to be powered with a diesel engine. I don't really want to go into the specifics because it'll fill this story with clutter, but either the gas goes in or the plant stops, and Mr. Tato loses an A load of money. So my contractors came in to fill the critically empty engine. At this time we were about an hour away from a dry engine and doom. Francis the plant director personally approves and escalates the entrance of my people as an emergency. Then Dr. Mikos stops the whole thing citing a health risk. My people can't work, and the power plot will stop. Eventually me, Francis, and the maintenance department got around it by asking maintenance to pump the gas themselves. But this move earned him the ire of Francis, and got the doc into my SH list. But that wasn't the thing that earned him my grudge. One day Priscilla asks for my help. She's the head of her own department, a very nice older lady who knows not a D thing about computers, and is constantly asking me for help. Because she warrants about half of my support tickets a year, you can say she's my primary source of income. Well, I'm working on her email because it won't load. Then Dr. Mikos comes in asking for whatever. And let me tell you, he was not just rude, he was dismissive, called her worthless. When I ask her about it after the guy left, she tells me he's like this every time. This is the moment that gave me casas belly. I started collecting information, discovered some very interesting tidbits and waited for my time. This will come into play later. One day, Dr. Mikos calls me into his office. He demands that I give him access to the open net, because at the moment he can't browse freely. This was my time. Well, I can't really do that. You have to create a support ticket and a request. This could take weeks or a month. Technically true. It took a couple of days most of the time. It will also have a cost for your area. This was also true. It would cost about a dollar a month. He stood there for a couple of seconds thinking. But you have internet access on your desk. You can browse anything, right? Give me access. And there it was. I can do that, but you have to keep it confidential, because it's outside of the corporate network. There's no surveillance. Do it. And I did. Usually in a corporate setting, employees have access to the heavily monitored and restricted corporate network. Mr. Tato's network has a team of people that block all the fun stuff and watch your every move. The network he asked me to route to his office is basically what you would find in a home. I mostly use it for things that need access to an outside network, and it only has my eyes on it. Yes, this was a trap. The moment I finished routing the cable to the doc's office, I set up a small backup laptop with surveillance software and started the capture. Called the doctor, told him his private internet is installed, and I reiterated how he should consider this an olive branch, and he should tell nobody about it. Now a couple of very interesting tidbits of information. Surveillance software is so cool. Basically it sees and logs traffic on your network. You see what every computer or device is doing on your network, what sites you're browsing and at what times. During the course of my investigation, I learned that Dr. Mikos was a serious creep. He earned infamy with his female staff with lewd and uncomfortable comments. Several female workers also complained, but due to the way HR works, Pete, the head of HR, couldn't do anything about it without hard evidence. But I knew what the capture would find, and the doc delivered fast. 
After a whole day of data capture, I showed the logs to Pete, and I was honestly almost impressed. Several different XXS sites at 10 a.m. Traffic to this various sites for about an hour. We asked the staff at the medical office, and at this time, he was shut into his office. Another visit, different site this time, at 1 p.m. lunchtime. Guess he was having a cheeseburger. And a third one at 5 p.m., one hour away from closing time. Dude watched XXX videos at work on his computer three times in one day. It was kind of hard to explain to Pete how data capture works, but that was it. Hard evidence. I apologized to Pete for giving me extra work, but he dismissed it. Said he was happy to have cause. Called the head of Medical Nationwide immediately. Dr. Mikos was escorted out by security the next day, and I showered his work laptop in alcohol before starting work on it the next day, and my days improved. Also, the title of the story probably makes sense now. The next story is... Only do as instructed? No problem, boss. So this happened a few years ago at the worst job of my life. Seven months of torture. Not sure why I stayed for so long. Backstory. I started my first help desk IT job being the only other IT staff apart from the network director, my boss. The first day on the job, boss was on vacation for a week on a cruise. I was left alone to take care of IT issues for a company with roughly 400 employees, with five different locations in different states. Boss had told me to contact him on Skype if I had any issues. The first day, an accountant lost Wi-Fi connection, so I did the Windows troubleshoot problems, and it fixed her issue in less than a minute. Couple hours passed and boss checked in and asked me how things were going. I responded, great. Accountant had Wi-Fi issues, but I fixed it. Boss asked me how did I fix it and I told him. He got upset because I should have asked him how to fix it or what I was going to do before attempting the fix. Bear in mind, he was taking approximately an hour between responses when I had asked him questions earlier in the day. Guess I should have had the accountant twiddle her fingers for an hour until he responded. Malicious compliance. Boss came back from vacation and had implemented a rule where I email a timesheet to him what I did every 15 minutes while at work. We were having a slow day and obviously I haven't learned my lesson from the first incident. There was a stack of old desktops and monitors thrown down in a corner near my cubicle. I thought to myself, let me take the initiative and get these stacked up neatly and notate their serial numbers for our inventory to try and impress boss. At the end of the day, I put that in my timesheet and emailed boss. On my way home, boss calls me. Blaze5G, what is this I see in your timesheet about sorting desktops and monitors? Told him it was a slow day, so I did it while I had free time. Needless to say, he got extremely upset. Got reamed out how he told me already not to do anything unless he asked. Tried to make my case, but he wasn't having it. Boss told me I should only do what he tells me to do and nothing else. The next day, still fuming about how unreasonable Boss was, I clocked in and told him I had arrived. He said I should research Microsoft Teams. It was just released, and he wanted to roll it out to the entire company instead of them using Skype. Aye aye, Captain. To Google, I went and researched all there is to know about Microsoft Teams. When Teams was just released, it didn't have much features, so I had a full grasp of how it works in 1.5 hours. For the rest of the day, I didn't hear a peep out of him. Well, that must mean he wants me to research Teams all day. Of course I didn't. I was on Reddit for the next 6.5 hours. At the end of the day, I emailed my timesheet. 8.45 to 5.45, researched Microsoft Teams. Ring, ring. Who could be calling me right after work? Oh, look, it's boss. Hey, boss, what's going on? Silence. Then boss says, you mean to tell me you spent all day researching Teams? Blaze 5G. Oh, yes, I did. As per our conversation yesterday, you told me only do what you instruct me to do. That's what I did, boss. Boss, I didn't mean it literally. If you had nothing else to do, you should have asked. Blaze 5G. But boss, I did have something to do. I had to research teams like you instructed, and boy did I research it. Boss, you better make sure you know everything there is to know about teams. Blaze 5G. I do, boss. See you tomorrow. He must have been fuming because he has a short temper. I slept good that night and was one of the few nights I slept well during that seven month period. The only other nights I slept well was my other malicious compliances quite a bit. I think I stayed so long because I was at the point of just not caring if I got fired, so I didn't get upset anymore. Just collected my paycheck and put in zero effort. I think I've been scarred or something like PTSD. I'm in a next IT job and it pretty much has zero stress, and I basically managed myself. Before I took that nightmare job, the job I had before paid the same and was amazing. Fixed computers at different sites. I left to get more experience with other IT technology, since there isn't much more to learn after fixing thousands of computers. The last story is, all of a sudden you want to follow the rules? Sure, we can do that. Here's your new price. I work for an auto group. Yes, folks, I'm a dirty, sleazy car salesman that takes grandma's social security check for a ride to the bank. Nevertheless, I work for a one price, no haggle, lowest price store. What we mean by this is we price all of our vehicles according to market value, 
which basically means we try to be very competitive and fair, and don't haggle on pricing. If you happen to find the same vehicle for less, we'll match it and beat it. I would argue we're one of the most ethical places I've worked at. Now, our lowest price guidelines are clearly outlined on our website, and they are, must be like to like, model, year, option, color, etc. Must be an official legitimate document from a dealership that clearly itemizes options, color, price with itemized discounts and rebates. Must include all fees, taxes, etc. to get the vehicle. No specialty units are allowed. No rewrite for rebates are allowed. Must have a VIN number. Providing we have all that, we match the offer and beat it by 5 o'clock. So we had a repeat customer of ours come in with what appeared to be too good to be true offer on a Hellcat Charger. The dealer was saying they'd offer him the car for $1,000 below invoice. Technically, we could decline the offer because it was considered a specialty device. Also, the customer said he'd prefer a different color if possible. We had a spare allocation we could give to this customer. He was a repeat customer having previously bought a Ram and a Dart for his daughter. He was a Mopar guy. So we decided to be nice and give him an allocation to special order a Charger Hellcat and worked up his discount. This man was getting an effing steal on an amazing car. We even explained to him how good of a deal he's getting and why we're doing it. We also made sure to explain the terms of the sale. Basically, the price we were giving him was the final price. No changes. We'd order the car and when it arrived, we'd finalize financing and off he'd go. So we move forward with the deal. He puts down a deposit. Around this time, sales in my area for Hellcats began slowing down as demand was getting filled. And a few weeks before his set delivery date, a new $500 rebate came out. Keep in mind, this guy was getting thousands and thousands off already a limited production Halo vehicle. His car comes in. That morning, another customer is looking at it and says he'd like to buy it. We explain that sorry, this car is already taken. The customer offers us $1,000 above MSRP to screw our repeat customer and sell it to him. We explain that we don't work that way. He gives us his business card and says if things don't work out to give him a call. He leaves. That afternoon, the original customer comes in and demands we deduct the $500 rebate from his order. We explain that we won't be doing that, that the only way we will lower the price is if he can provide a quote from a competing dealer that demonstrates he can buy it for less, and we'll be happy to match and beat that offer. He then threatens us and says if we don't give him the extra $500 rebate, he's going to walk away. We remind him that his $2,500 deposit is not refundable. He's getting a limited allocation vehicle for $1,000 below invoice, and we're doing this to be nice. He of course calls us crooks and said he's not going to reward us with his business. We ask him if he'd like to sign cancellation papers and walk away from the deal. He says sure. So he signs cancellation papers, in the process forfeiting his $2,500 deposit and walks away from the deal. We call up the customer from that morning explaining the deal fell apart on the Hellcat and if he wants to pay sticker for the Hellcat, we'll give him the $500 rebate and he can be driving that night. Two hours later he's in the office, writes us a check, we confirm with his bank he's good for it and do a finance backup contract in case the check bounces and off he goes. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.